Good afternoon, New Vine family. It's been a long time since I've been here. For those who are a little newer to this community, uh, you probably heard from Pastor Ted King. He is my husband. Uh, so I am the, the other King in our family. So uh, I think New Vine is going through uh, the series of different books of um, Psalms. And today I chose the chapter uh, 67 because it's one of my favorite chapters of Psalms. Um, as I was reflecting on this Psalm, it took me back close to 30 years ago when I was starting off in college. Uh, during our first year, I decided to go on a mission trip with our church family. And part of the training was to read this book by John Piper called Let the Nations Be Glad. And it was based on chapter uh, 67 of the book of Psalm. And there was one sentence in that book that just grabbed, uh, grasped my heart. Um, it, re it reads, missions exist because worship doesn't. And that deep conviction that we need to go to the nations to declare and share the good news of Jesus, to bring missions uh, for the sake of calling people to worship God, became a very personal conviction for my life that I devoted all four summers in college to go to Mexico, out of all places. We actually went to the jungles of Mexico, where the only way to get into these villages was to hike six, seven hours. So it was a backpacking trip, but we went into the village. We found, uh, we tried to find a person of peace, and, you know, they welcomed, they're, they're so hospitable, they welcomed us. We slept on their floors or out in the open. They fed us, and we were able to share the gospel with them. Now, during the school year, I wasn't a good student because I thought evangelism and missions were the absolute most important thing in life. School comes second or last. So all year long, we were just preparing for the summer mission trip. And um, I went to seminary to become a missionary. And for those who don't know, Ted and I came to uh, the church in San Jose over 22 years ago to eventually be sent out as missionaries, and we are still here. So I had to really you know, process through this uh, chapter 67 of Psalm because that was a chapter that gripped my heart for missions, and we are still here in San Jose. And so I was really asking the Lord, what relevance does Psalm 67 have for believers here and now living in Silicon Valley? So as we get started, can we all rise? I believe there's a PowerPoint, right? Okay, let's all rise and read the psalm together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now, before you sit, I'm going to ask you to move around. We're going to Get into groups of two or three. Three is ideal because we're going to do some interactive stuff with uh, those in our community. So I'll give you about 30 seconds to find someone to form a group of three. No more than three. Two is okay. All right. Thank you. I will let you know when you can turn around and chat with your friends here. Now, Psalm 67, the context is that it is a community psalm of thanksgiving because the people of Israel had just experienced this harvest. And so there's this usage of us because it's a community psalm. And I want you to keep that in mind, that it's a communal us-ness um, that the psalm is focused on. So there's three main questions we're going to answer as we go through the book of Psalm chapter 67. The three questions are, how can we shine? What do we shine, and why should we shine? So the first one, how can we shine? 
First one starts with be gracious to us and bless us. You know, often in our family, we always pray every night, God bless us with a good night's rest. In the morning, we say, God bless us with a great day, bless us with health, bless us with prosperity, bless my parents to live a good old life that's filled with joy, bless our friends, bless this, bless that. And so much of our blessing requests are focused on ourselves, our own happiness, our own comfort. But today, I have to tell you the truth is that God's understanding of how he wants to bless us has nothing to do with our happiness or our, our security or our comfort. The way that God wants to bless us is that he wants to form Christ in us. And often that Christ formation allows us or invites us to seasons of challenges, of difficulties or struggles or pains or disappointments. I think uh, Ted was here a couple of weeks ago and preached about how the night is normal. It's normal to go through these hard seasons of life. And in those seasons, God meets us with his presence. God meets us with his grace. God meets us with his faithfulness and forms this beautiful Christ in us. God is more concerned about making us holy than happy. God is more concerned about forming Christ in us more than our comfort and our security. This is the blessing often that God wants to bless us with. Verse 1 continues, may God make his face shine upon us. How does God shine his face on us? I want us to look at the example of Moses in Exodus 34. Let's read this together. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. Moses loved God's presence. Moses lingered in God's presence. He had face-to-face -face encounters and conversations with God. Another part of the Bible says that God spoke to Moses face-to-face -face as one speaks to a friend. Can you Say of yourself that God speaks to me face to face. How much of us enjoy just lingering in God's presence? Moses had a friendship with God. When you walk out of church today and maybe head down to Castro Street to grab dinner, could somebody say, Wow, you are radiant. What is it about you? You know, we want to be that kind of people that carry God's radiance, even to strangers. So the question is, how can we shine? How can we shine? It requires a surrender. When we look at what God does, it's God who does the active actions. God is the one who is gracious to us. God is the one who blesses us. God is the one who shines his face on us. And what is required of us is to come with an empty hand an empty heart and say, Lord, we are here to receive, not according to what we think we deserve, but according to what is best, according to how you want to bless us, according to how you want to speak to us face to face. Verse one is also a reiteration of a famous priestly blessing. We sang that song today from Numbers 6, 24 and 26. Let's read this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Back in the time when Aaron was blessing the people of Israel with this priestly blessing, the goal was for their peace, for their shalom. But here in chapter 67 of Psalm, it's not just about receiving peace, but it says that May God be gracious to us. May God bless us and may God make his face on, shine upon us so that. There's this important clause of so that. And in verse 2, it says, so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among the nations. In Genesis 12, 2-3, when God calls Abram, 
He speaks this to Abraham, says, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God's blessing to Abraham was for God's blessing to go through Abraham. In the same way, God's blessing to us is so that God may be known through you and me. So church, how do we shine? It requires a surrender for God to actively be gracious to us, to actively bless us, to actively make his face shine at us according to his ways, according to his perfect will. And we shine by following the example of Moses who lingered in God's presence, who had face-to-face encounters with God, and whose face was radiant. The second part is what? Do we shine? Obvious, we shine God. I want to pause away from Psalm 67 and and have you group with your fellow little triads or pairs and ask these two questions. What do you spend the majority of your time doing? And sleep cannot be one of the answers. And how fulfilling is this activity? I'm going to give you just about three minutes. Every person takes about 60 seconds. Answer these two questions in your small groups. Okay, what are some of the responses? What do you guys do for the majority of your day? Work. Work. Anything else? Prayer. Awesome. Worship. Are there any students here? What do you do for the majority of the day? Study, or we should be studying? Okay, so whatever your answer was, whether it's work, 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 prayer, worship, study, some of you may be retired, some of you may be actively volunteering for things, some of you may be home taking care of kids, I want you to name that as work. That's when I say work in this message, I'm referring to those main activities that take up your day. So for a lot of the adults, we go to work. Whether you're an educator, health, healthcare professional, lawyer, caregiver, um, engineer, stay-at-home parent, you are all, we are all working. So how does the Bible define work? There's two books. Uh, who likes to read here in this church? Okay, I love to read and I'm always reading something or listening to something. And so for those who love to read, I want to just present two books to you to consider. Uh, One you may be familiar with is Tim Keller, Every Good Endeavor. And this book really talks about how to connect your work to God's work. Uh, The second one is a very brand new book called The Sacredness of Secular Work. And um, Jordan Rayner talks about how your job matters for eternity even when you're not sharing the gospel at work. He also has a podcast called Mere Christians, which I have fallen in love with because he brings different people from different industries to share how they worship God through their work. It's just a real encouraging and inspirational podcast. So when we look at Genesis, we read about how God worked and how he looked at his work of creation, of Uh, man and woman, and he called it very good. And in Genesis 2.15, it says, God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. That word work is abad in Hebrew, and that same word is used in Exodus 3.12, which is translated as worship. So that same Hebrew word can be translated as work or worship. So when we think about it, we have to realize that work is worship. It's not two separate things. God saw it all as one thing. But so often we reduce worship to be what happens on Sundays here. And we think work is just my Monday through Friday thing. But I want all of us to see how work and worship all is in this one word, Abad. In 1 Corinthians 15, can we read this together? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This labor in the Lord is anything and everything that we do 
in Christ. God's not, work is not just what happens here at church or for a Christian organization. It's what you do day to day. That is your work. That is your worship. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, all work matters to God? Unless you were engaged in explicitly sinful, evil work, that is not significant to the Lord. But aside from that, all other work is valuable and matters to God. But when sin entered, it broke God's original design of work, that our work became frustrating. You know, as students, my worst subject was physics. I hated physics. It was so, I was so frustrated with physics. You know, for, for people at work, you might be frustrated with company policies or trying to figure out how to design this next product. But God today is reminding us to invite him into our workspace. Tim Keller says this, you will not have a meaningful life without work, but you cannot say that your work is the meaning of life. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Work matters to God, but work cannot be our idol or it cannot be simply a means for our wealth or status, but work is a worship unto the Lord. I want to mention just a few terminologies um, to you today that uh, is shared in these two books that I read. The first is secular versus sacred. Secular literally means without God. Sacred means with or connected to God or holy or set apart. Now, as believers, we are a sacred people. We are declared holy before the Lord. We have been set apart for the Lord so that anything our hands touches becomes sacred. When we come into this church, this is sacred ground because this is where the followers of Christ gather together. And I have to say, when you enter your work tomorrow, when you enter school tomorrow, it becomes sacred ground. Because you carry the presence of God. So the question I have for you today, the answers are going to be sacred or secular, okay? How would you categorize work done by Pastor Douglas? Sacred or secular? Sacred. How do you... Some of you guys have questions about his work? No. How do you categorize taking a science test this week? Sacred or secular? Okay, I'm not hearing very confident answers here. What about trying to win that triathlon competition? Sacred or secular? What about producing the next Google or Apple product? Secular or sacred? I'm going to answer this question by sharing uh, an experience and conversation I had with one of our mentors. Years ago, he asked me, Sandy, who is the most famous woman in the Bay Area? If I were to ask you that question, who would you name? My first response was Christian or non-Christian? Let's get the categories right. And he said, why do you think in such polarized ways? Why can't you see people and everything under God's common grace, under God's big world? That conversation shaped and rocked me. I realized that I needed to be the same person whether I was out in public spaces with non-believers and in church. I really started thinking about how I speak and how I act. Jordan Rayner in his book says this, the only thing you need to do to instantly make your secular work sacred is to walk through your front door or log onto Zoom. When my children were entering public schools in kindergarten, every day as we dropped them off, we said, when you enter school as a child of God, you're going to change the atmosphere of the school. You carry God's presence and wherever you go, you're going to set the culture. You're going to set the atmosphere. And we brainwashed them to believing 
that they, as a little five-year-old, carry the same presence of God that we carry, and they can change the atmosphere of their school. Do you believe this for yourself? Think about the workplace. Think about how difficult it is. Think about your school and your classroom. Think about some of the relationships you have or some of the relational tensions you may have even in your family. Do you believe as carriers of God's presence, we can change the atmosphere, even in the most, quote, secular places? There's another terminology I want to present is the instrumental value and the intrinsic value of work. The instrumental value says this. Let's put that up. The instrumental value of work says this. Your work matters for eternity because you can leverage it to share the gospel with those you work with. If this is how we work, how many of you have succeeded? I would say most of us are not in church ministry. Most of us, 99, maybe 0.5% of the time, we're not engaging in sharing explicitly the gospel message. We're working. And if this is a value of work, we've all missed out on what work is. But fortunately, this is not the purpose that God has for work. And sometimes this intrinsic value also says, work hard enough so that you can get enough money to give to New Vine, to send more missionaries out, to take the gospel to the nations. That's part of why we work, but that's not the main reason why we are to work. For those who have been generous with your giving, thank you, but that's not the ultimate purpose of your work. Now, there's this intrinsic value of work that says your work matters for eternity even when you're not leveraging it to share the gospel with those you work with. Church, our work needs both instrumental and the intrinsic value. Now, let's tie all of this concept of work back to Psalm 67. What do we shine at work? There's four descriptions of who God is and what he does, and I'm going to just walk through it really quickly. We shine God's ways. In verse 2, it says, so that your ways may be known on earth. When I think about God's ways in our workplace, I think about how excellent God's ways are. He was never a mediocre God. God's ways are good. God's ways are gracious. God's ways are holy. So New Vine family, how are you reflecting God's excellence in your workplace? How are you reflecting God's grace and his holiness? In your workplace, how are you extending God's generosity in your workplace? It's the little things that you do, seen and unseen by human man, human eyes. God sees it all, and it makes a difference at work. The second way we shine is God's salvation. In verse 2, it says, So that your salvation may be known among the nations. Your salvation among the nations. The word salvation is a holistic word. It means to save, to heal, to make whole, and to deliver. Think about the people you interact with daily. Is there one person that you can think of who needs wellness in their mind, wellness in their soul, wellness in their body? Perhaps God has placed you in that person's life to be an instrument of his saving power to pray for them to speak wellness to them, to speak peace to them, to speak salvation to them. John Ortberg says this, salvation isn't about getting you into heaven. It's about getting heaven into you. And I want to mention this because so often we are driven by sharing the good news so that we can lead someone through the sinner's prayer. And we think, I've done my job. Let's move on to the next person. We forget how God reminds us that we need to preach about the kingdom of God, how that kingdom of God needs to transform every part of our being. It's not about the sinner's prayer or someone raising their hand to believe in Jesus. It's really about getting the kingdom of heaven into our lives. So church, how are you shining God's saving power and his salvation at work? The third way is we shine God's justice. In verse 4, It says, you, God, rule the peoples with equity. 
This speaks about God being our king and our judge. God is a God of justice. He makes all things right. So how are we reflecting God's justice at work and in our lives? Think about those in your workplace, at school, who are marginalized, who are overlooked, who are bullied, who are made fun of. How do we respond to some of these injustices? How do we respond when we see a lack of integrity or corruption in our workplace? Do we turn a blind eye or do we ask the Lord for wisdom, asking, how can I shine the heart of justice, God's heart for justice in my workplace? God has placed you where you are to shine his justice at work. In the last ways, we shine God's care. Verse 4, it says, you guide the nations of the earth. The word guide really represents what a shepherd does. God is our shepherd who cares, who loves, who guides his people in truth and in grace. How are we caring for others at work? Will you take a risk this week to approach someone and and find a way to care for them in the ways that they will receive it. And that's how we can shine the love of Christ to those at work. Let's read Philippians 2, 14 and 16 together. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Church, God has commissioned you in your work to shine among all the people that you encounter, to shine brightly like stars in the sky. He knows what a crooked and depraved generation and and world that we are living in, but he has placed you exactly where you are, to shine for him. The last question that we want to answer today is, why should we shine? In verse 6 and 7, it talks about how the land yields its harvest. God is a God of the harvest. He is the one to bear fruit. He is the one that calls people to himself. He's the one that adds his followers to his spiritual family. We are responsible to sow the seed, but God is the God of the harvest. And as we think about this, it's a prophetic promise that God is going to bring in his harvest of many, many believers. Our role is to shine brightly for him. What will this harvest look like? In verses 3 and 5, it repeats the same phrase. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. In verse 4, it says, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. In verse 7, it says, may God bless us still so that the ends of the earth will fear him. There's a prophetic promise that the, all the nations, all the peoples, the ends of the earth will fear the Lord. That is going to be the end of the story. So why should we shine? We want to be part of that harvest. We want to be a part of ushering people into the kingdom to fulfill the promise of God that a harvest is coming filled with people who will praise him, who will rejoice in him, and who will fear him. Now let's make this super practical for us. I recently met a new friend And uh, he spoke at the Nexus Summit that some of you attended and have prayed for. He was a former director at Google. He was a team lead that produced Google Homes, Google Photos. And he was sharing with me how he led a team of 70 to launch Google Home. And when when Google Home went public, the team had to dissolve. And so the team asked him, can we meet with you one last time? And the question that they had for him was, what's your leadership secret to create the culture for this team? He was blown away by that question because he didn't realize he was creating culture. And he simply responded, said, I'm a Christian. I follow the ways of Jesus. Jesus values people over products. Jesus values people over programs. I just followed the way of Jesus. And at Google, 
With 70 of his teammates, he shared the gospel. That is how we shine, church family. All the months or years leading to the final launch of Google Home, he did not mention the name of Jesus, but he shined brightly that his team was asking, what's your leadership secret? We all carry that secret, and that secret sauce is to shine the ways of Jesus. What an excellent example. You may not be in a team lead role. You may feel like, who am I to shine? But you carry the presence of God, every single one of you. You don't carry less of God than another. God deposits the same Holy Spirit in all of us, and we get the privilege of carrying that to work. Several months ago at the San Jose Church, uh, we had a combined baptism service with our Vietnamese church. And at the end of the service, I noticed a dad from visiting somebody who was getting baptized. He came up to me. He said, you're Sandy. And I said, I remember you from my daughter's school, elementary school. For years, I let the PTA at the school, and when he saw me, he's like, I knew you were Christian. And Ted was like, I think everyone should say that about all of us. He said, I saw and I, I observed the way you led the PTA in the public school, and I just knew you were Christian. So seeing you at this church proves I got it right. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> that he can say that about me, but it was also a challenge. Can somebody, can everyone I encounter say that about me? Can people at work say that about you? You know, can other believers smell and see Jesus in you? Let's start from there. Let's start from there. So there's a last quote I want to share before we break up into our small groups. It says this, if we were to live out our lives with excellence for the purposes of God in every sector of society, we would not have to shout so loudly to make our message heard. So many of us are so um, more focused on sharing the gospel with just our words that we forget that we are to shine with the ways that we live our lives, the ways that we work with excellence the way we shine God's ways, the way we shine God's justice, the way we shine God's grace and his care. It requires all of that. And so as we wrap up right now, you know, that phrase about us-ness, it takes a community to do this together. We cannot be lone rangers who work, go to a work Monday through Friday and think we can do this. There's a reason why we can gather every week to recharge, to realign, to remind ourselves of why we are called to community, and we cannot do this alone. As we get back into our small groups, I want to ask you to answer these two questions. How will you cultivate a friendship with God? And to whom and how will you shine God's ways, his salvation, his justice, and his care. I'm going to give you a good five minutes just to process these questions together because I want you to leave today's service with some practical tools that you're going to take back as you go to work tomorrow. So let's spend some time answering these two questions. So I bless you today to love the presence of God just as Moses lingered in God's presence just as the Lord spoke face to face with Moses as he does, he would a friend. May God consider you a friend. That he would speak. That you would have this intimacy with the Father. I bless you to carry God's presence wherever you go into the most difficult situations at work into the most difficult relationships at work, that you would carry His peace and reconciliation and presence, that you know that there's a deep knowing that the Lord has placed you exactly where you need to be to shine brightly for Him. So I just bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen.